Abby Johnson is in the other room. Here. Our first order of business is to present Planned Parenthood's Employee of the Year Award. Abby Johnson. This is Abby. She's our newest volunteer escort. Abby, this is Cheryl Alessandro. I'd be the youngest director in Planned Parenthood history. You'll actually be in charge of the abortions at your clinic. I have a chance to make a real difference. No matter what you do for the rest of your life, you're still going to be a baby killer. The only thing that's changed is you, Abby. Can you even hear yourself talk right now about these procedures? These are little babies. I'm not going to apologize for doing a job that helps women in crisis. There's still a part of me that isn't sure. I know. But the one thing that all experts agree on is that at this stage, the fetus can't feel anything. Sorry to bother you, but they need an extra person in the back room. Are you free? Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I'm your host, Matthew Pekvich, and this is episode 203. Out now in cinemas across the United States is Unplanned, a biopic on pro-life activist Abby Johnson, whose conversion from clinical director at Planned Parenthood to anti-abortion advocate inspired a best-selling memoir and now a feature film that defied all odds to not only get made, but defies all expectations and succeeded at the box office. Joining me now to talk about Unplanned is the film's directors Chuck Consulman and Carrie Solomon. Chuck and Carrie, I thank you very much for joining me on the podcast. Thank you for having us. This has been such an incredible past several days. Um, Unplanned hits at number four at the box office. In the meantime, already making back its budget. Um, the Twitter account gets suspended. It returns. It grows to 300,000 followers. You have endorsements by even the likes of Vice President Mike Pence. I mean... Wow, what has this been like for you over the last several days since this movie has come out? I, I, I think it's, <clears throat> it's pretty amazing. Uh, we're humbled because, you know, being a smaller movie, um, you never expect anything. But what we've gotten is the support of the American people and, uh, and from all over the world, as a matter of fact. We're getting requests to fly to almost every country in the world and bring the movie. So it's humbling. You know, we, we're here because uh, of the movie, and it's just, it, it is amazing. When you were first approached to do an adaptation of Abby Johnson's memoir, not only to write the screenplay, but to, adapt, but to actually direct the movie... Um, what was your reaction to this? Did you know about Abby's uh, story beforehand? Is it, was this something that was new to you? And also directing, this is something you both haven't done in a while. Was this something that was very exciting for you to do, you, you both to do as well? Well, we weren't actually approached. Uh, what happened was we were sitting in a coffee shop talking about a Western that we wanted to do. And, <clears throat> and a girl that we happen to know by the name of Megan Harrington walked up to us and said, hey, guys, and she showed us a book, and she said, you need to make this a movie. We spent a couple of minutes with her, and she walked off, and we looked at it, and it was called Unplanned, the Abby Johnson story. And I looked at Chuck, he looked at me, and we both started to laugh because, like, yeah, right, we're going to do a chick flick. I don't think so. Hmm. Abortion. No, I don't think so. And then, you know, we just kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's, it wasn't in our wheelhouse. So what happened was that basically uh, we went home, but we prayed on it. We made the mistake of praying, and we said, uh, because we do that with everything we do, and then what we did was we asked the Lord, uh, we're making a Western, right? And he said, what I want you to do, what I really want you to do is I want you to do Unplanned. And that's how we started off, and it was just amazing. And then we read the book, and we realized why. It was so compelling, so empowering. It was just amazing. How soon does Pure Flix get involved in that? Are you guys like in exclusive with Pure Flix to make movies just for them? Or is that something they were looking to do with Abby's story as well? Or was this something that just came through uh, one thing after another? It was the best you guys worked together previously and it was the best way to move forward. Uh, we actually got together kind of late in the game. It was once we had a film that was 90-95% uh, complete. And we showed it to uh, Michael Scott, who's one of the principals there. And uh, we were actually a little concerned. We said, Mike, look, we might wind up with an R rating on this. Uh, is this something you want to pursue, that you're willing to pursue? He was very willing to uh, pursue the risks involved. 
He spoke with his business partner, who is David A.R. White, uh, and they have a distribution guy there who is incredible by the name of Ken Rather, who actually was Regal's film booker for 18 years. So having had a lot of experience with them, we felt very comfortable going into a distribution arrangement with them, and it's worked out very, very, very well. One thing you guys did with this movie is that you sent the script to Abby Johnson for review. Now, she's not a creative partner in the film. She's not a producer. Um, so this is not really typical of the normal kind of process. Was this something that was really important that you wanted to get her voice involved in the authenticity of her story? Well, you know, we always do our research. For example, if we're doing a story set in Japan, we'll go to Japan. Uh, if we're doing a story set on whatever subject, we study the period, the time, the place. Uh, you know, I think it's important that you know. But we knew immediately we had to interview her. It was her story. And we, we felt that uh, we needed to tell the truth, not be biased, no propaganda, no, uh, no trying to take a position. Just tell the true story. The truth will set you free. And so what we did was we went out to Texas for a week, interviewed her, her mom, her dad, her husband, her kids, you know, uh, the lawyers, you know, everything and everyone that was in the process. <coughs> and, um, and we wanted her to be able to see it for two reasons. Well, really like three reasons. One was that we kind of promised her she would be involved in the process. But also we wanted her to be able to take a look at the personal, interpersonal dynamics of her journey, make sure it corresponded with what she actually went through. But we also needed her for a technical advisor. You know, there aren't many people you can go to to say, look, uh, here's what, here's the names of the drugs, here's, you know, dosages, and say, here's procedures. Is this stuff reading properly? Is this the way it was done? Is this the pricing scale? Is this what the interactions were like between clients and the administrative staff? And outside of Abby, I don't know, I don't know where we would have gone for anyone to do that you know we really wanted to portray as carrie said everything authentically to the point where in the first abortion procedure that gets shown in the film uh which is actually the procedure that changed the ultrasound guided procedure that changes abby's life we cast dr anthony levitino who's a retired abortionist and for his surgical nurse we cast a retired surgical nurse who would come out of the industry through abby's and then there were none organization which helps the people to transition out of the abortion industry so uh, you know, we had all the right equipment sitting in the room, but when Doc Levitino sat down, he reordered the instruments on his tray. You know, he put them in the order where they would be in the order he would be using them and they, they were at hand. And then when he went to work with the stuff, he did so very convincingly in a very professional uh, fashion. And it just just lends this tremendous air of authenticity to everything that's going on that way. When it came to Abby's memoir, when that first came out, there were some criticisms from certain members of the, of the media in regards to authenticity of her story. Um, how important was it for you guys to investigate those claims? Um, how far deep into that did you get there? Um, and how happy were you by the end of your final product, your script, that you knew yeah, you had the true um, story in your lap ready to go to film? I mean, it, it, it's an absurd take that they did to, to kind of defend themselves uh it's total totally false i mean because literally everything they accused her of first of all we had the court transcripts mm -hmm. i would urge anyone that thinks that abby may have been fabricating to read the court transcripts which i have a copy of by the way and would be happy to forward it was one of the most <laughs> absurd uh it wasn't technically a trial it was a pre-trial hearing but it was absolutely absurd they fabricated this whole list of supposed theoretical charges against Abby, that she'd stolen medical records, that she'd made them public, that she'd revealed the secret identities of the doctors, and it went on and on. And um, after Planned Parenthood presented their its case, uh, the judge said, you know, Mr. Paradowski, that's, uh, that was Abby's attorney, he said, uh, do you plan on mounting a defense? And Jeff being Jeff said, I don't know, judge, that's mostly up to you. And, and he called him judge. And he's like, why is that, Mr. Paradowski? He's like, well, we've been here for a while, and I haven't heard anything that sounds that even vaguely like evidence, mm. and the judge said, you know what, you're right, we're going to lunch, case dismissed. So, <clears throat> so when you combine the, the court transcripts with Abby's testimony, but also, I mean, we've heard things like, well, Abby never worked there, it's absurd, we got the pay stuff, you know, she showed us eight years worth of paycheck. I, think I mean, it's just, it, it, look, this is the, the same rhetoric that goes on in, in any conversation where one side or the other, either side, 
wants to defend a position that's basically uh, hiding the truth or is a basically weak position. They have to come up with some kind of uh, thing that they, you know, they can stand behind. I'm, I'm reminded of the Profumo scandal that brought down the, the British uh, prime minister, you know, a, a couple of gen- well, a generation and a half ago when the woman who was uh, a call girl was on the stand and, you know, the, the attorney basically was saying, Mr. So-and-so says he never met you, doesn't know you. And she just looked at the court and said, well, he would, wouldn't he? <laughs> you know, in other words, the Planned Parenthood is kind of like, well, we didn't have a baby of that gestation and we don't do ultrasound. It's like, well, they, yeah, they would say that, wouldn't they? I mean, if your business model includes, is basically based on killing babies for money, it's really not a big, a big leap to, to uh, fibbing about it. After you have your screenplay, you've got everything ready to go, you need to cast your Abby, and you found a really great actress in the name of Ashley Bratcher. She did a terrific job here. Um, I, re- I think this is going to be a really big kind of breakout role for her. Um, having Ashley on board, was that someone who Pure Flix, Pure Flix already knew of or had thought of casting in the role, or is she someone that you two uh, both had a hand in casting in the, in the movie? I, I have to take a step back just so you understand the relationship between us and Pure Flix. Mm-hmm. Pure Flix had no say in, in any of the movie whatsoever. Okay. And to this day, they have no say. Now here, we've had a long, amazing relationship with them. Uh, we've done a lot of movies with them, but about four or five years ago, four, maybe three, four years ago, we did not do God's Not Dead 3. We did one and two, and so we parted ways with We felt it put on our heart that the Lord was going to lift us up, and he wanted us to go out and do movies, so that's exactly what we did. So we, in our own way, became a pure flicks on our own, in other words, making movies, you know, doing writing, producing, directing. So, But we've had a long relationship with them, Mike, Scott, and David White. There, we have a great, great, you know, uh, interaction with them. And so uh, when they heard we were doing Unplanned, they came to us and said, look, we'd love to be involved. We didn't jump at that because at the time we were still shooting the movie. But, uh, you know, we talked over, you know, let's say five or ten times over a period of a year and a half. And we finally said, you know what? We felt that they were the ones that, you know, they, they had a sincerity about the project. And so we said, look distribute the project and that was it but everything other than distribution uh it, that that was all our company daryl lefevre who did i can only imagine myself and chuck uh and so basically all the thoughts and ideas and stuff like that for how we were going to do the movie and then we ran into a tremendous amount of friction from everyone in the industry mm. you know people saying oh you got to make it less bold oh you got to do this you got to do that but you know one of the gifts of being independent and not depending on anyone else, is you get to make the final decision. And so we're very pleased uh, with the ability to do that. And how did that decision come about with casting Ashley in her role? How, where did you see her? Did you know of her beforehand? Was there a huge audition process for getting the uh, role of Abby Wright? Well, to borrow from Bismarck a little bit here, uh, those who have a fondness for sausages and movies should not watch them being made. Hmm. Uh, so um, we had gone through actually offers to three leading women, and uh, we were turned down three times. And we had gotten down to being within four days of shooting. It was Thursday. We had to shoot on Monday. We didn't have a lead actress. And by the way, just so you know, I don't know how much you know or uh, of the industry. I'm sure you, you, as a movie reviewer, you have a pretty uh, good understanding. But in case your your audience doesn't. You don't cast your lead actress four days before you're rolling. That's like building a skyscraper and there's no concrete or steel on site. True. Not even water for cement. Yeah, so it, it's uh, in prayer what we'd gotten is that basically, and, and it was kind of a white knuckler there, uh, that whoever it was going, the, the three women that we'd approach who initially all wanted the role and then I think the weight of what they were about to undertake settled down on them and it broke them. Um, what we got in prayer was that whoever the actress was couldn't know for very long or she would break under the pressure. She had to find out at the last minute and say yes and get thrown into deep water and learn to swim. Additionally, by the way, we didn't actually want Ashley, which is one of the miracles of the movie, because I think she's absolutely fantastic. She is. She's the best female actress that I've I've encountered. Uh, her commitment She's not a diva. She's easy to work with, and she loves her craft. I mean, I've, I've rarely seen anyone 
who is so committed to the craft of acting. And she came prepared and she knew what she was about to do. But we didn't want her because the audition tape she sent to us, we didn't like it. Hmm. But what happened was we had a series of events. I found another girl, thought she was perfect, sent me her stuff. Couldn't find her email. She had no contact information on her website. No phone number, no email. I mean, how do you be an actress and not leave contact information? That was crazy. Then I went to another girl. I said, oh, this girl is going to be great. And she called us. And she was in another abortion movie. She's a professional actress. She's beautiful. She totally gets it. She was like, this is my movie. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And we were totally fired up. But when we got off the phone with her... What happened was, uh, randomly, I just was on the internet, and a video of her comes up, and there's an interview going on, and the guy, uh, the interviewer says, uh, so, what do you think of, of abortion? And the girl just kind of looks at the camera, and she's like, the actress looks at the camera and says, well, um, you know, uh, I think it's important that... Um, so she was wishy-washy. You know, everybody has the right to make their own decision. And I said, this person is not going to be able to stand up to the heat and the pressure. And that's not the kind of reaction we want. I want somebody who's committed. So literally, one by one by one by one, all these actresses get swept away. And finally, the last person who I probably looked at three or four times is Ashley. So I said, okay, you know what, let's test her, let's see if she's committed. And in fairness to her, by the way, we never sent out, because we were so protective of the screenplay, because we didn't want word getting out, we only sent her sides for a couple of scenes. So she was trying to build a performance around seeing, you know, four or five pages of script, rather than a whole story. And so we, uh, we reached out to her, and on the phone she said to me, she said, uh, this is my story to tell. Now you hear that a lot. But she was so passionate, so full of the spirit. And then she said to me, look, I don't know if you'll believe this or not, but two years ago, the Lord came to me and said to me that he had a mighty work for me to do, but I wasn't ready. And so he would prepare me. And when it was time, he would come retrieve me. He would come to me. And, uh, and she said, and I've been preparing myself mentally for this and she says, and I know when that phone rang, in other words, that this is that movie. This is my movie to tell. And she was so committed. And I said, you understand that you might never work again, that they're going to blacklist you. They're going to try and destroy you. Uh, and she just said to me, I love Jesus. I, I need to do this movie. I, I, you know, we need to put an end to babies being murdered and stuff, that kind of thing. I'm all in. And she was courageous. I mean, she was, that's the best, the best phrase I could use. She's courageous, you know, because how many people would basically willing walk in to the kind of friction and heat that somebody like her is, is going to get from making a movie like this? Let's not forget Hollywood is a pro-choice town and this is a pro-life movie for the most part, although I will say we didn't take sides for the most part. We tried, What we did is we tried to s just tell the true story. When it comes to the shooting of the movie, you guys had to do this in secret. Um, there were concerns about the protests, safety. Um, were there any inclinations beforehand that people might protest? Did you receive threats of anything of the kind? Or did you know, considering the issue at hand and what the movie was about that there could be some type of friction with people uh, because this is a very passionate subject in a passionate debate that's still happening right now. Yeah, we intuitively wanted to avoid the kind of problems that dogged the Roe vs. Wade production. Uh, I think they were announcing early on looking to generate some publicity with the fact that they were shooting. I don't think that they uh, actually informed the cast and crew uh, or certainly the crew of what movie they were shooting. So I think they had some problems internally. Uh, we took the exact opposite approach. Uh, we went to Oklahoma, which is kind of the most, one of the most conservative areas in the country. Uh, we didn't even go to one of the major metropolitan areas there. We went to Stillwater, uh, which was, uh, you know, a town of about 30,000 when school's not in session. And because uh, uh, Oklahoma, um, Oklahoma State University is there. And so we, uh, we filmed under an assumed name. We asked all of our cast and all of our crew to please not mention in their emails, uh, not put anything on social media, no photos on their Facebook page. 
And this is one of the many minor miracles. Somehow, in an age of social media, we got a thousand people to keep a secret for about three or four months. Mm. And everybody just honored that. We all had this. Uh, ev- the, the, the crew was very well aware that they were going to be, um, you know, working on a, a pro-life project. A lot of these people knew that it would cost them work in the future. We had a wardrobe designer who, who, who outfits a lot of country music stars. She's like, I know this is going to cost me work, but I want to do it. We offered everyone the chance to serve either uh, without credit or under a pseudonym. And in the end, I, I, was, I was pleasantly surprised. I will admit I was a little shocked. No one took us up on the offer. Everyone wanted to serve under their own name. It was though everyone was proud to be associated with it. And even if it was going to cause them some difficulty in the future, they wanted to be known as associated with the project. This is a film that had a lot of roadblocks, um, pre-production, post-production, during filming. One of them that I found really interesting is that um, you were denied music uh, rights from most music studios. Um, yeah. I was kind of curious, what was the original plan? What were the original choices you were looking at for music in the film? Uh, well, you know, they were, they were kind of fun choices. There's a, there's a, there's a, a driving montage uh, when Ab, Abby is on her way to work at the very beginning of the film. We actually wanted to use Girls Just Want to Have Fun, the original Cindy Lauper version. Actually, mm-hmm. it's not the original. She's, she redid the song from an earlier version, but we wanted the Cindy Lauper version. We couldn't do that. There's a trick-or-treat scene uh, later in the movie. We actually wanted uh, Danny Elfman and Oingo Boingo's uh, Dead Man's Party there, which would have been a lot of fun. Um, you know, a lot of the pieces were lesser known, but they were controlled by studios. There's one key scene in the movie in which uh, a truck driver is wheeling some barrels out of the facility, and the pro-life protesters are outside uh, the fence that's outside the facility, and they ask the driver if they'll just stop with the barrels for a moment if they can pray over them because there's the remains of fetal remains of hundreds of children inside and we had used as temp music uh, a piece of score from uh it's not a re- well remembered movie there was a there was a uh kevin costner movie for disney called uh the guardian yep. about rescue swimmers from back uh, about 15 years ago or a little better and we put that in there and the music worked beautifully uh yeah and we had about three or four other instances, and we went we went zero for nine, uh, as far as anything that was controlled by a studio. We- and the funny thing is that you know, in a lot of cases, small movies don't have money, so you ask for a favor. We had the money, yeah. So we, but before we even got to that, they would ask us, "Are you Christian?" Is this a pro-life movie? Or, the, or we got to that. We negotiated a price. A couple of these pieces we were paying, you know, we were looking to pay like $40,000 to license. And we got far down the road. And then they said, oh, are you, is this a movie about abortion? And are you, are, are you taking a Christian stance? And we said, yes and yes. And they're like, yeah, not interested. So essentially what we're saying is that uh, industries within Hollywood and entertainment industry are discriminating against filmmakers based on their religious and political views. Yes. yes, I mean, you know, and it's kind of sad, really, because, you know, I think Hollywood for a long time, I mean, we've been the beacon to the world. I mean, we've been bringing out uh, movies for 100 years and we've been talking to the world. And now we've kind of wandered away from that to one side politics. And I don't think that not only do I not think it's fair, I don't think it's uh, you know, I don't think it's just trying to stop people from making a living, from making art. I think filmmakers, in a certain extent, should be free, creatively free. I mean, it's about free speech. I should be able to make whatever movie that I want to make. Yeah. I mean, there's, and, and if I can do it well, I mean, if I make a bad movie, well, that's on me. If I make a good movie, well, that's on me, you know? And I, I just don't, I think the, the uh, Hollywood has lost its way. It's become too, way too political. And and uh, I mean, this is just a perfect example. That's just some of the stuff we got an R rating. OK, Happy Death Day, which is a slasher flick, got a PG-13. Mm. We got an R rating. We have no vulgarity, no sex, no cursing, none of none of that stuff. And they're giving us an R rating. You know, it's it's inappropriate. So we're currently in a strange situation where in much of the United States, a young woman can go and actually have an abortion without her parents permission. But if she wants to go see a movie about it, she has to not only get their permission, but come get them to go see it with her. Yeah. And, and I just like to state also, you know, there's a lot of movies that Hollywood puts out 
that I don't like. I don't like. The, I don't want to see the story. I don't agree with the thing. And you know what? I don't go to the movie. Yep. I, 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 say, yeah. I mean, it just seems totally wrong and unfair in in a in a thousand different ways. I mean, at the end of the day, it all depends on whether the audience wants to see a movie or not. And in regards to unplanned, they, there is definitely an audience that did want to see it. So the initial projections for opening weekend was around three, four million. Um, you guys did six. Um, you already hit your budget within the first weekend. Um, now the film is expanding. Um, when you saw the box office results for this film, were you surprised or did you know that there is a pro-life movement movement out there that were hungry for a film like this and were only willing and ready to watch in cinemas? Because I, I've been reading tweets from people who said they were driving hundreds of miles to, to out of their states to try to find a place that did have it. They went to it and they gave a praise. And I, there's a lot of people out there who went out of their way to watch this movie because there was a movie that they felt was important to watch. Yeah, I mean, we definitely have... Uh, we're, we're having that reaction. We're getting people going three, four, five times to the movie already. The numbers are building. We opened at 6.4. Uh, the last two days added to that. We smashed expectations the last two days. I think we're going to have a bigger weekend the second weekend than the first. I mean, movie theaters are sold out all over the country. The theaters are expanding us into bigger screens and multiple more viewings. I think that basically, you know, now we're believers. Not everyone who's listening to this obviously may not believe. But from our perspective, this is our perspective, whether it's true or not, we believe it is. Uh, We knew that from the first moment we took this on, the Lord spoke to us and he said to us basically, you know, the equivalent of in human speak, you know, I'm going to do a mighty work here. And, you know, you are my vessel to do it. Go forward and make this movie. So we were not surprised at the box. But what we were surprised at is we started to get hundreds, thousands of emails and texts. You know, I was a pro-choicer. I didn't realize now I'm pro-life. You know, we, I mean, some of these emails, I mean, are so compelling you could make a movie on the email. You know, I, I had three abortions and I was lied to and, you know, but I still was pro-choice because I, I didn't realize – it goes on and on and on. And we're hearing, I mean, all these amazing stories of people also, uh, which is even better. A lot of people, a lot of women and men, surprisingly, have sent us, called us, texted us, emailed us and said – I had an abortion 50 years ago, and it has ruined my life. Every day of my life, I've thought about it, and I'm finally free. And we're getting this everywhere. Women are – I mean, it's just – because it's the movie is not about condemning anyone. We're not saying the left is wrong and the right is right or this is good and this is bad. No, we're not doing that. We're saying, look, this is a movie about hope, forgiveness, uh, redemption. And I think when you just look at it fairly, which is what we tried to do, the abortion workers, for example, inside the clinic, these are real people. They have to feed their families. And we tried to convey that. And, you know, and even Abby said to us, you know, for most days we had a great time in the in the in the facility. It was just on the operation days when the abortions were occurring. Ten ten days out of 11, they would have a lot of fun. Every other Saturday was surgical abortion day and it was all hands on deck and it was rough. Hmm. Uh, last question I have here. Um, so a big battle line issue that's happening in the entertainment industry now is the Georgia heartbeat bill. So if people don't know, um, in the state of Georgia, a law has been passed that says if a uh, if a fetus is detected to have a heartbeat, that is declared a human life and cannot be aborted. So this has caused a furor from a certain segment of Hollywood. There's been a petition. Um, So Georgia was very important in the entertainment industry because of tax incentives. A lot of people from Hollywood filmed over there to take advantage of those tax incentives. Now they're saying they're going to boycott. Um, So I think this is, in my opinion, a really good good timing, actually, in regards to the Unplanned movie because we've shown that a movie about that's pro-life uh, pro-Christian um, and should have not have made the box office dollars that it did um, has succeeded expectations. Do you think this is a chance now for filmmakers um, such as yourselves, um, such as people from Pure Flix and other places as well to, to jump in and maybe 
go to Georgia, start filming there, and start make Georgia a hub for maybe um, films to be made that can to, that can deal with issues like this. Um, that say a studio in Hollywood. Um, or other entertainment people who we've talked about have are discriminatory towards people's religious or political practices. They can jump in there, in there um, start using Georgia as kind of like a hub, a creative hub to bring their um, projects to life. Yeah, I'm going to address part of your statement at the beginning first. I actually think that the film was instrumental in getting that law passed. You know, behind the scenes, about two weeks before that law was passed, the bill was passed. We showed the movie, the entire movie, to the Georgia State Legislature. Wow. Everyone was willing to come. And we know that it changed some votes in the Senate. It passed the Senate first. And then last Friday, while we were at the NRB, the National Religious Broadcasters Conference down in Anaheim, the House there voted on the bill. And they voted in favor 92 to 78, which sounds like a, a pretty solid win until you realize that in Georgia you need 91 votes to pass. To go into law, which I believe is half the House membership plus one. So it won by one vote after the after the legislature having seen the film. And the governor, Brian Kemp, uh, when he signs the bill into law, has actually asked Ashley Bratcher, our lead actress, to stand beside him as he signs it into law. <clears throat> so I believe that the film has influenced and quite likely was instrumental in the law getting passed. As far as Hollywood... I think Alyssa Milano, at a certain level, overstates her importance to uh, overestimates her importance to the industry, in terms of the the entities who fund the networks who make television and the studios are not going to pass up a thirty percent tax credit for political correctness. They're just not going to do it. Yeah. Atlanta has already become a hub. Atlanta production wise and everything else, I mean, it's it's rivaling Hollywood already. I mean, no one's going to leave Atlanta because basically uh, they're going to stop production because they spent billions of dollars to reconstruct and, and create. Now, I wish this to, I wish actually from a, from a purely personal, purely Machiavellian standpoint, I wish the studios would desert Georgia because the credit would remain. You know, we seriously evaluated going to Georgia to produce our movie. Uh, that was the other contender besides Oklahoma. But when we looked at it, we said we can't we can't get a crew. We can't get a decent crew because the studios have gobbled them all up and they can outspend us. They're all working. Yep. So uh, so 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 if Hollywood wants to go back to Hollywood, they're welcome to do that because people like us and there are a lot of us out here. We'll go to Georgia in a second and we'll use, you know, we'll use whatever we can down there. And that goes to your other point. Would that happen? And I would say yes, absolutely. Uh, faith and values driven filmmakers would gladly flock to Georgia and look to take up the slack. Well, that, I, I imagine that's what you would have said. Um, and I think that would be if if a boycott were to happen, that would be the best way to go. And I think a movie like Unplanned really does show that no matter what uh, roadblocks are placed ahead of you, the persistence, uh, the faith you had in the material, um, the faith that you had in your audience as well showed that it can be made a success. So I say congratulations both to you, Chuck Consulman, Carrie Solomon. Congratulations once again on the success of Unplanned. And look, I really look forward to seeing what you guys do next because I, I think that um, there's something going on here. Uh, I think uh, the audience, there's a strong segment out there that's showing that films like this uh, not only need to be made, but people are willing to watch them. So congratulations to you and thank you very much for joining me on my podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>